Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to this podcast. Um, thanks for joining us. I know we have a few people uh, coming in. Um, should have a lot more folks coming in. I want to thank you. Um, a bunch of you have uh, sent questions in advance, which is super cool. So I've got all your questions right here. I'll go over them, you know, for sure and answer them. I also thought I would uh, um, just kind of go over some, just give a little bit of a talk about this topic for sure, get into some of the details. But your questions are amazing as I was reading, just reading through them. And there's so much really great information here I want to share with you. Just answering these questions would almost be like enough. So let's dig in. You know, this talk is about Ayurvedic weight loss and uh, cravings. But, you know, we need to know that this is not really about just losing weight, but it's also springtime. It's a great time of year for us to think about resetting the ability to burn fat as a natural source of fuel. That's what's trying to happen at this particular time of the year. If you think about it, um, there's no starch being harvested right now as we speak. It's a very austere harvest for that matter. Uh, if you were living completely off the land in the spring, particularly now, it would be hard to get much food whatsoever and you wouldn't be eating bread or any grains or anything wonderful. You would be you know, just sort of forcing your body to burn its own fat. And that's what springtime is. It's a natural fasting, calorie restricted, intermittent fasting, time restricted, time restricted time of year to be eating. So it's a really important time of year. It's nature's new year. It's a really important time to reset your body's ability to burn fat as fuel for the rest of the season. And don't forget now, fat is not just lose weight fuel. And of course, it's nice with summer coming. Everybody wants to look better, you know, in their bathing suits and all that. And it's normal to gain a little bit of weight in the winter. And it's also normal to lose a little weight in the spring. This is normal and should happen. It's normal to gain a little bit more weight in the fall when all the starches are being harvested and all the other mammals on the planet are gorging themselves with all the nuts and seeds and grains and everything to store a little bit of extra fat for insulation and reserve fuel. So we're supposed to dramatically, not so much dramatically, but definitely change throughout the year. The bugs in your gut change dramatically from bugs that are guts that are particularly predominant in microbes like actinobacteria that are really good at fat and fiber to help deliver um, the ability to burn fat as a natural source of fuel. Come summertime, end of summer, the bacteria deets, which are really good at digesting starch, are harvested. The enzyme called amylase, which is the enzyme specifically designed to break down starch is produced more in all of our bodies at the end of the summer than it is now in the springtime. We are circadian beings. We ebb and flow with the natural cycles of nature. And part of that is changing our diet. So this is the reason why I did this podcast today was because, or this time of the year was because this is the time we should be thinking about burning fat. Fat is calm fuel. So you handle stress more evenly when we're burning fat. It's stable fuel. It's non-emergency fuel. It's sleep through the night fuel. You know, think about it. If you're gonna sleep for eight solid hours and not eat anything, your body has to burn fat to get you all the way through that eight hours. A lot of folks don't have the ability to burn fat throughout the night. And as a result, and as a result, um, they don't sleep either through the night or they don't sleep deeply. They're constantly waking up and going into light sleep. So the ability to be a good fat burner starts now in the spring and it lasts you for the entire year. Nature's nutritional cycle is an annual cycle. And it all starts right now. Started with the equinox and the window between the equinox and the solstice is like the magical time. This is like nature's new year reset, a brand new stable of bugs in your gut. By eating those bitter roots that come out of, your out of the ground this time of the year, more of those dandelion roots that are in your garden, um, more of the ginger roots and turmeric 
uh, these root vegetables, those, those early spring greens that you can get out of your garden if they're coming out wherever you live, grab those out of your, because they're loaded with the right bugs for the right season. And we want to inoculate our gut with the right bugs for the right season to get you into fat burning all the way up until the end of the summer when we want to then flip into more sugar burning to prepare for winter. That's sort of the circadian rhythm. So this is the time to lose weight. This is the time to burn fat. This is time to get rid of the cravings because when you're burning fat, you're stable. You're, when you're burning sugar, you're up, your sugar levels are going up and down. And this is the problem with most of us is that we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of um, sugar imbalances. You know, prediabetes is an epidemic. Uh, more than a third of the population have prediabetes, more than 42% of the population is obese. It's sort of like a crazy time right now. And I wanna share with you like why this is happening and what are the reasons for that? So let's just start with, um, let's just start with the microbes. There's microbes in your mouth and in your esophagus and in your gut that make enzymes that help you digest harder to digest foods, right? So if you have foods that are not organic and they've been sprayed with pesticides, you're gonna kill the microbes on the food. So you're eating something sterile, which is one thing, but you're also killing the microbes that help you make in your mouth, that help you make the enzymes to digest things like wheat and dairy and nuts and seeds and legumes. And we end up having a weak, link in our digestive system. So we're not breaking those foods down the way that they should be broken down, right? So that's one thing. When you eat sterile food, because it's been sprayed um, with pesticides and all the bugs are, are been, been killed, I can share with you a study done uh, in, it was in uh, New Mexico and in Utah. And they took, there was a museum down there and they had uh, microbes, they had mummies, I guess, um, ancient humans that were in the museum. And they figured out a way to take the fecal matter and measure how many bugs they had in their gut. And they did that. And then they compared the, these microbes of these ancient humans that were a thousand years old compared to modern humans. And there was such a lack of diversity in their guts. They literally called it an extinction event. That one of the reasons why we are not living or not living along and the species might be not reproducing as well, as well as it could. I mean, if you look at 1970 till now, the reproduction rates are 50% lower. And it's not just because people don't wanna have babies, maybe that's part of it, but it's also because there's an infertility level that's just off the charts because of endocrine disruptors and pollutants and pollens and pesticides and all of these, uh, all these things that are not pollens, but pollutants that are irritating our, our gut lining. So, so eating foods that are sterile, which have no microbes in them, is again, killing the microbes that are gonna make the enzyme to help you digest, and also making room for opportunistic bad bugs to take advantage of that space that was created by these pesticides. Inside your intestinal tract, inside your respiratory tract, on the skin of your body, it isn't like there's room for new bugs. Every swing set in the playground is taken. The only reason how you get new bugs is by getting rid of some bugs. And most of the bugs that take advantage of these um, holes in our microbiome because we kill them with pesticides are what are called commensural bugs. They don't do anything good or bad. They take up all the real estate. So they're sort of sitting there taking up space. So they have to sort of go, and we have to then repopulate with good permanent bugs. And that's how we change our microbiome. And so it's really important for us to think about, first and foremost, is to not eat you know, the very best we can, eat organic food and stay away from conventional food. The other big cause of this is processed food. Processed food has been processed to, this, to, this, to the extent where um, these sugars and the nutrients are so easy to get into your bloodstream that they surge sugar into your bloodstream. And, um, and what happens when you, when you do that is um, you end up with more sugar than the body can actually handle or use. 
And that extra sugar initially will give you a super high and then it'll sort of drop you. And when it drops you, the brain goes, oh, I liked it up there and I want another dose of that sugar. And then it is short lived and what goes up sort of comes down. And a lot of us find ourselves throughout the day, you know, injecting ourselves with a cup of coffee on the way to feeling good. As soon as we feel good, it's short lived and we're on the way to feeling bad again. Then we need, then the brain pulls down the menu, says, I need a cup of coffee, I need a donut or whatever it might be. And I'm on the way to feeling good again. And I start crashing and then I'm, then I'm on the way to feeling bad. So most people spend their life when eating sugar on the way to feeling good, on the way to feeling bad, never really feeling really good. When you burn fat, you're feeling stable throughout the day. You don't have the cravings, you don't have the need, you don't store the fat, you're burning the fat. You're feeling calm, you're sleeping through the night because you're burning the stable, non-emergency endurance fuel, long lasting fuel, that we're designed to burn. Definitely in the spring, definitely through the night. But even in, even in the summertime, we should be still have that ability to burn fat and not be completely addicted to the sugar, right? So that's why it's really important for us to understand the, the downside of the processed food. Processed foods are those foods on the inside of your grocery store that basically stay on the shelf for a very, very long period of time. There are polyunsaturated fatty acids. There are oils that come out of seeds that they, when they take the oil out of the seed, the reason why there's a seed around it is because they, the oil is so volatile to even the lightest bit of light that the lightest bit of light would make it go rancid. So when they squish down these seeds and make oil, that oil is so volatile that it'll go bad very, very quickly. So to make it stable, they had to boil it to 450 degrees, bleach it to make and, and deodorize it because it stunk so bad after they processed it. And then they thought that stuff was gonna cure heart disease back in the 1960s. And it turned out, well, it didn't really do that. So what happened was they, um, they had to uh, um, use it for something else. And they found out that they put it on a loaf of bread, the bread never got hard anymore. And if they put it in a cracker or in a cereal, the cereal could stay fresh forever and ever and ever. And the problem is that the, bugs on the counter that would make the bread get hard, they eat oil. But when you put that highly processed oil that are preservatives that extend the, shelf, extend the shelf life, but not your life, and you put that in your mouth, it is indigestible by you and your microbes. Your microbes won't eat it, you won't digest it. So where does all the oil that nobody will eat go? Directly to your liver. And that creates liver congestion or bile sludge. Now, here we go. You've eaten a bunch of food with pesticides on it that have, that, that have killed the microbes and make the enzymes so you can't digest it. You created a bunch of bile sludge with processed foods that are now, that's lodged in your liver and gallbladder creating bile sludge. Now you don't have enough bile to emulsify the fats. So there's a coordination between your stomach making acid, your liver making bile. And if you don't have good bile flow because of all the congested foods, and the one way you know that you have this or don't have this is go eat some really bad greasy fried food or really rich cream sauce and see how you feel. If you feel like the food's just sitting there, you're burping, belching, feeling nauseous, you just know I can't eat that. I'm not saying that you should, but you should be able to. I mean, your digestion should be able to pull that off, right? Like when you're 18, you could pull it off. Now you can't. So that means that our digestive strength has been broken down. And for sure, take the foods out of your diet that are harder to digest for now, but that doesn't fix anything. We need to go fix that digestive strength because in Ayurveda, the cause of, the cause of 85% of all disease comes from the digestive tract. And the studies show that if you don't break down your proteins very well, that's your gluten and your nuts and seeds and dairy and grains and lectins and things like that, and you don't digest your fats, your greasy fried food was an example, not that you should eat that, or other fatty foods. You know, the environment, the, the EPA reported that 70 million tons were dumped in the American, our atmosphere, in, it was in 2021, 70 million tons dumped in our atmosphere. So it goes into the air, drops down into the food, the water, even the organic vegetables are getting hit by that, which means that these fat soluble chemicals have to be digested by you. But if you can't eat greasy fried food, what are you gonna do with all those environmental pollutants, which are all fat soluble? They're gonna go into your liver, into your gallbladder. You're not gonna break them down. And the proteins, because of weak stomach acid and the fats, 
because of lack of good bile? The studies show that they go undigested into your intestinal tract and they act as irritants that irritate the lining of your intestinal tract. And when they're irritated, when they get irritated, when the intestinal tract gets irritated, those proteins and the fats will be too big to get into your bloodstream and nourish you, right? So your brain isn't gonna get the message that I just ate. So it's gonna always have that alarm bell going, I need more food, I need more food, I need more food, right? So when those foods are incompletely broken down because of upstream digestive weakness, you're gonna have a chronic message of hunger, crave more, but you're also gonna have those proteins and fats go into the garbage can, which is unfortunately not the toilet. It's the lymphatic vessels that line your intestinal tract. The lion's share of the lymph in your body lines your intestinal tract. That's where your gut immunity lives. That's where you're dumping most of the trash out of your intestinal tract in, in the most efficient way as you possibly can. That lymphatic system is trying to deliver good fat and good protein to every cell of your body for structure and energy production. But if that lymphatic system is chronically bombarded with undigested gluten, right? And you eat that on a regular basis, that excess gluten, way more than should be there, is gonna enter into the lymph, cause extra weight, bloating, gas around your belly. It's gonna get pushed into your lymph, make your skin break out. It's gonna be pushed into your brain, what they call it the brain lymphatic or glymphatic system that dumps three pounds of plaque and trash out of your head every year while you sleep. And if that system gets congested, you're gonna have brain fog, you know, or a food coma. So these are the symptoms people have when they eat wheat and they blame the wheat. Well, okay, wheat's hard to digest, I get it. But it isn't, it's a canary in the coal mine. It's telling you that your weak link in your ability to digest those foods is causing you to not digest other foods completely. They're going into your gut, irritating the lining, breaking down the intestinal barrier, going into your lymph, causing storage of toxins and storage of fats in and around your belly and your hips. And that's the primary cause of weight gain and primary cause of craving more food because you never really got satisfied in the first place because the brain never got a message that I was fed. I chewed it, I swallowed it, I anticipated feeling good, but the brain never got the message because the nutrition never got out of your gut into your blood. It ended up going, because it wasn't broken down completely, you ended up going into your gut associated lymphatic tissue. And there's a ton of science behind this. And, and that's why I wrote the book, Eat Wheat, because I wasn't like trying to get everybody to eat wheat. I don't care if you eat wheat. It's not like a thing you have to eat, but it is a thing that you should be able to eat. Like I said, it's a you know, canary in the coal mine. If you don't have the ability to digest certain foods, then we need to fix that, right? So here's, how we, here's what we know. And we're trying to lose weight here. We're trying to do it right, right? Not to say, okay, go on a crash diet and fast. You could fast all spring and you'll lose some weight. And maybe you have some good healing effects from that because fasting is really beneficial. But if you don't sort of understand how your digestion works, you're probably going to end up with the same problem come summer or come fall or come winter again anyway. Because we didn't really fix the underlying weak link. And that's what I see with my patients again and again and again. They can't eat wheat. They can't eat dairy. They can't eat grains. They can't eat rice and beans. They can't eat lectins. They can't eat all these things. And then all of a sudden, as we boot their digestion, they can start digesting again. And what that means is that not only is their digesting of wide variety of foods, they're getting diverse microbes if they're organic. Also, they're also getting um, what's really important is they have a digestive system that is based on um, that is directly linked to gut immunity. You know, studies show that people who, and I don't want you to think this is just a wheat study or a wheat lecture, but it's an example. People who ate wheat had four times less mercury in their blood in one study than people who were gluten-free and gluten-free because they didn't have to be, right? Not just celiac. Another study showed people who were eating wheat had significantly more good bugs and less bad bugs than people who were gluten-free. They had um, significantly more killer T cells than people who were gluten-free. They had less heart disease and less diabetes than people who were gluten-free. See, the book is out. The research is in. 
what's happening is when you bubble wrap your diet, because you're not digesting well, it feels better, but we set ourselves up for other nutritional deficiencies down the road. Harder to digest foods, nightshades, goitrogens, lectins, oxalates, wheat, dairy, these things, not that you should eat them a lot. They're actually very seasonal in nature. And those are, create a little bit of irritation in the intestinal lining that allows you to create what we call gut immunity, which is 70% of your immune response. So you think, why did we all blow up with COVID? Well, a lot of us don't have a great immune system because we don't have a great digestive system because we were told that wheat is the number one public enemy. You should take that out of your diet. And no one ever said you should fix your digestion. It drives me crazy. You know, I did a podcast and interview with David Perlmutter, the, the author of Weight, uh, Grain Brain. And twice we interviewed together. And my mother said I won both of those debates. So pretty sure I did. Uh, but the point is, and the point is, is that he now knows that, that it's not about taking wheat out of your diet. Of course, you got to eat whole grain, non-processed grain. You should eat organic or heritage or, or you know, ancient grains because they don't have the glyphosate. And you can get that in America. You can get good food in America um, the very best you can. So the point is we have to strengthen your digestion. And, I, and in um, this um, podcast, in the notes there, I gave you a... Uh, a document, a Google Doc, and I listed a whole bunch of articles that I wanted you to all to have to basically get more information. And in that Google Doc, there's a whole article on gallbladder sludge and how to get rid of it. There's a whole article on uh, my weight balancing ebook uh, on, based on a research study that I did years ago. There is a blood sugar and health and longevity ebook there. There's a digestive troubleshooting guide ebook there link. Um, there's other articles there we'll talk about in a minute. So there's a lot of resources there for you to start learning all for free. Everything there is all free. All you do is just, you know, just go to the, the link and it'll take you to the eBooks and to the articles. And so they're all for free for you there as well. So that's a, an important piece of the puzzle. Um, the study that I did back in 2000, we did a study down in South Denver at a yoga center. We had about 20 something people in our study and we had them eat a breakfast and a lunch and a supper. Um, and we, the first step of the study was to get rid of all your snacks. Just have breakfast, breakfast to lunch, lunch to supper with no snacks. And uh, I had a patient of mine, he was 524 pounds when he first came to see me. He said, John, I got to lose weight. I don't know what to do. And I said, Dick, I want you to do one thing. So you want you to have a, you know, a good sized breakfast, whatever you need to get you to lunch. I said, then I have a nice, big, relaxing meal at lunchtime. I said, if you're hungry at dinner, it's because you didn't need a big enough lunch. He lost 63 pounds in three months just doing that. He called me up and said, John, this is amazing. I'm usually like, I went to lunch. I had like three or four entrees. I mean, he would eat like crazy. He said, but I wasn't hungry at dinner. I usually I'd go home and I watch a movie and I'm eating popcorn. I just can't stop eating. But I was still stuffed from lunch. About 63 pounds in three months. So all he did was have a nice breakfast and a nice lunch. Well, it turns out that now the circadian science is in. That is Ayurvedic wisdom for thousands of years. They said breakfast and lunch are the two most important days. Now we have studies that show you eat breakfast and lunch or lunch and supper, the exact same number of calories. You lose significantly more weight. You have much better metabolic health, cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar, things like that. If you have, if you front load the food versus um, uh, back load the food, later load the food, whatever that is, eat the food later in the day. So that's how that works, right? So having that breakfast and the lunch worked really better, works much better. So in our study, we first said, okay, let's just get rid of the snacks because this was back in 2020. And that was when, I don't know if you guys remember, but the craze was, Six meals a day, eat a little meal, little meal, little meal, little meal throughout the day. Remember that? You remember that, that whole crazy thing? Well, you know, that just shows you how crazy diets are and how quickly they come and they go. There was no research back on that. It has been completely debunked that you should eat little meals throughout the day. You should have the ability to eat a meal and then make that energy last for a long period of time, right? And that's how you burn your fat. If you have a breakfast and then a snack and then a lunch, you're gonna burn the breakfast and the snack and then your lunch. If you have a breakfast and nothing to lunch, in between breakfast and lunch, you're gonna burn fat. 
you have a lunch, and then you have a snack between lunch and supper, maybe use some almonds or an apple. You're going to burn the almonds or the apple, not your fat, between lunch and supper. But if you have nothing between lunch and supper, you're going to burn your fat. And if you have supper and nothing throughout the night, you're going to break the fast because you broke fat. You could burn fat throughout the entire night. So our study went like this. We had to have three meals a day with no snacks. And they complained like crazy because they were like not having their snacks. But they did it. They signed up for it. Then we asked them because that was going very well. I said, well, it didn't go well. They complained a lot in the beginning, but once they get over the hump of like starting to burn fat and not just having meal snack, meal snack and having the sugar going, their body going up for sugar and down for sugar and up and down, up and down, up and down, never really feeling satisfied. Always on the way to feeling good and on the way to feeling bad, never actually feeling good because you're not burning fat, right? You with me? So um, we then asked them to have a smaller supper, a breakfast, a bigger lunch, and a smaller supper. And that smaller supper was like a soup or a salad. And once they were able to do that comfortably, and they complained about that a little bit, but once we got better at burning fat, it got easier for them. Then we asked them to have a earlier supper, have a breakfast, a lunch, and then an earlier supper. So this is how you sort of, and this is all in the, 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 the ebook, the weight balance ebook, and in some of the articles I sent you. So all we're trying to do is just sort of, excuse me, slowly nudge your body into fat burning. And so after they had, you know, a breakfast, a nice big lunch, and then a earlier supper, if that went well, and for a lot of them, it did. And a lot of them said, hey, you know what? I'm having a really big lunch and I'm feeling really good. I'm not even hungry for an earlier supper. Do I have to have it? And I was like, no, you don't. So they started having a breakfast and a lunch and no supper. And guess what they were doing back in 2020? They were intermittent fasting, doing a 16 eight eating window of eight hours, sometimes even less than that. Because in breakfast and lunch, it was sometimes wasn't even eight hours. And sometimes it was six, you know? So, so all, and all of a sudden when we did that, it was about an eight week study and we measured their anxiety, depression, their cravings, their weight loss, they're exhausted after sleep, after work, how tired they felt when they came home from work. We also measured their sleep and they were all significantly better. They lost 1.2 pounds for the entire week. Now, for, per week for the entire study rather. Um, so it was pretty amazing because it didn't just make them lose weight, right? They were more, more stable. They had more energy, they had more endurance, they slept better. And if you're not craving and you're not having anxiety, you're not having depression, and you're not, and you're and you're feeling good in your mood and you're sleeping better, don't you think that's going to affect your hunger and your cravings? Absolutely. And you've also reset your ability to burn fat and you've got off the sugar roller coaster ride. There was one woman in the study, I'll never forget, and she said, um, she said to me that uh, um, I'm doing this and I love it and I feel so good and, but I haven't lost any weight. And I was like, okay. So every week she'd come and she would, we'd had a meeting every week and she'd raise her hand and she would say the exact same thing. I feel fantastic. I'll never stop eating this way, but I haven't lost a pound. And I was going, you know, this is a weight loss study. It'd be helpful if you could like, you know, lose a few pounds, it would help our numbers here. And she said, and she came there every week through the entire study. That's what she said. Six months, maybe nine months later, she came into my office as a patient. And she walked in my office. I said, how are you doing? She goes, guess what? I said, what? She goes, I lost 25 pounds. I go, when? She goes, I don't know. You know, I did exactly what you said. I told you I'd never stop doing it. I feel so good. I've never stopped doing it. And she said, one day I just started feeling like I was like really thin and lost and my, my clothes weren't fitting. So I finally got on a scale and I lost 25 pounds. And she was this sort of like super hyper driven sort of yoga teacher, you know, kids work. I mean, just going, 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 going. And the only rational explanation that I had for this, which has been proven to actually relate to weight gain and weight loss, was that it took a while for her body to be convinced that the war was over, that it was safe for us to burn the fat. Because when you're under stress, the body goes, store fat, store fat, store fat, because it thinks it's going to like, you know, 
is like a, a game end kind of situation. So she finally started doing this, having a big lunch and getting her body used to, to not having those snacks, slowly convincing her, her body it was okay to burn the fat. And she finally lost all that weight. So that's kind of a beautiful idea is that when you start realizing that you're burning fat, which is non-stress fuel, and you start applying meditation and yoga and breathing, which are all linked to better metabolic health and weight loss and all that, you really begin to start seeing that you start to really lose those pounds. Now, there's a lot of seasonal changes that we should make during the springtime. I have a grocery list that gives you all the foods that are sort of harvested in the spring. We call it coffee reducing foods. You can eat off of that grocery list and you just circle the foods on that list that you like eat more of those spring harvested foods in the summer, circle the pitta or summer grocery list, and the winter circle the winter or vata grocery list and begin to change your diet, get the right bugs in the right season, eat organic foods, get off the processed foods, get off the processed oils, and of course do the basic things like exercise, yoga, and breathe. Um, and in our study, like we said, the circadian clocks tell us that we should be done eating before the sun sets. And anything eaten after the sun sets is basically going to sit there because the cooks went home at sunset. So that's a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, so um, I have a lot of questions here, and you guys can start typing things into the, <clears throat> into the chat. And I'll get into a lot more detail here <clears throat> through these questions. I have a ton of really good ones. Um, so here we go. Um, this is from Layla. How can, one, how can uh, you help someone who's kapha pitta and overweight and lose weight in the spring? This person continues to have uh, carb and sugar cravings. So kapha pitta you know, is sort of like called a spring summer type. Spring is earth and water. Pitta is fire. I'm a kapha pitta myself, or bat pitta, pitta kapha rather. So I could easily gain weight. I have that tendency if I didn't do the right things. And in the springtime, it's kind of like really interesting. The spring is kapha season. Nature is right now, it's raining where I'm at right now as we speak. The earth is very muddy. If you went for a hike in the woods in the spring, you're going to come up with muddy feet. Muddy feet. The earth is holding on to more water. We hold on to more water this time of the year. This is an important time of year to realize that we're going to tend to gain more weight in the spring, right? It's sort of an insulation process for dealing with the excess dryness that we had all winter because winter is cold and dry. So spring is providing the moisture for seeds to germinate, for good bugs to proliferate inside your gut, on your skin, in your respiratory tract, as your gut immunity or your immune response. So, but nature had a plan to not let you just gain weight in the spring. And that was in the harvest. The harvest of the spring is austere. It's a pungent, bitter, and astringent harvest. So those are the three tastes you wanna be thinking of. Lighter foods. You know, think about spinach and leafy greens, and there's parsley coming out of my garden. There's still kale coming out of my garden. There's things that are very, uh, the dandelion roots. You know, dandelion is a root that, and a plant that they used to call pissenlit in France before they came to America. And some Frenchman renamed it dandelion, the tooth of the lion, but it was already named in France. They had their signals crossed, called pissenlit, which means to pee in the bed. Because dandelion root, everybody knew that if you took dandelion root tea, which everybody drank before you went to bed, you would pee in the bed because it's a natural diuretic. And what happens in the spring? It hits, it floods your garden, your lawn, and that root and those leaves and those flowers are designed to help move kapha or water weight out of your body. So many of us in the springtime have a lot of extra water weight. So that kapha reducing diet, the pungent, bitter, and astringent foods are perfect for helping us lose the weight. Also calorie restricting, doing what I just said a little while ago. You can just go to, if you can do it and it feels comfortable to do it, just go to a breakfast and a lunch and skip supper. But remember, if you do that and you're 
craving something at nighttime, your body's gonna to respond to that as a emergency, which is a fat storing, sugar burning emergency. So we don't wanna put your body in any kind of stress. We wanna slowly nudge you into handling uh, burning fat in a more natural way. So I hope that works for you. Can you reset uh, without doing a 21 day detox? Of course you can reset without doing a 21 day detox. You know, we have a cleanse called the short home cleanse, which is a ghee or alternative fat uh, cleanse, which is a free ebook. I put it in the link as a free ebook and you can download it and do the whole cleanse for free without buying a thing from us, just so you know. Um, but what's kind of really interesting about the short home cleanse is that Woman's World Magazine, which is one of the ones at the grocery store counter, called me up and said, can we uh, do one of your cleanses? And I said, yeah, sure. You can go to my website and download the short home cleanse. It's free and just do it. I didn't hear from them for like nine months. And they called me back and they said, hey, can we do a, a, a fact check interview with you? I said, on what? He goes, well, we took your short home cleanse and we had about 40 people do it. And the results were amazing. We want to, and we want to write it up as a feature story. And, they and she told me, she said, these are people did the cleanse right, off your, right out of your ebook and they lost 11 pounds in four days, which was on average. I was like, I didn't believe her, but you know, because people don't always lose 11 pounds in four days, but they always reset fat burning. And um, so one of the ways that we do it is with a four day detox, as opposed to a 21 day detox, which is a, it's a long haul. We also have a 14 day Colorado Ayurvedic cleanse, which is more of a digestive reset, liver cleanse, intestinal skin repair, kind of the whole kind of thing and detoxify the heavy metals and fats out of your deep tissues. But the short home cleanse is a really nice, you know, Thursday through Sunday detox and you're eating three meals a day still. So you're not starving. So that's something you can get more information about uh, on my website and learn more about doing something like that. But you can surely reset your fat burning very quickly. You can also just start having, like I said, with, my, with, the, with the research I did, start with um, three meals a day, no snacks, right? Then smaller supper, super salad. Then it's all good, right? No strain. Then earlier supper, right? Then if that's good, skip supper, right? That's the final one. And you do that for a couple of weeks and you go back to three meals a day, no snacks to maintain. Start gaining a few extra pounds, go back and start skipping supper again as long as that's comfortable for you. One way to sort of hack that and make it easier, if you know you're gonna skip supper, and I've done this many times myself, is I'm just gonna make darn sure I have a really big lunch. You know what I mean? I wanna walk away from that lunch meal satisfied. And for the first night or two, I'm going like, it's like seven o'clock at night, I'm still stuffed. I'm going, okay, that was way, I ate way too much. Okay. But I've convinced myself that I'm not gonna starve. And then it's sort of, then I, then I, kind of start dialing down the size of my lunch, but I'm very satisfied in the evening. And then you can drink a lot of water during the period of time where you're not, uh, where you're not uh, eating in the evening, which is really cool. Um, what is the best approach to preventing weight gain during menopause? What herbs should be useful for digestion at this stage of life? Okay. Um, you know, during, after menopause, the meta metabolism begins to slow down digestive strength begins to slow down. So you wanna classically reboot the strength of your stomach acid and increase the bile flow. And you also want to support lymphatic flow. As we slow down our metabolism, we tend to you know, eat the same food, but gain more weight, right? How many times, how many have we experienced that, right? We're eating the same amount of food we used to, but now I'm gaining weight from it. That's because the digestive strength has dialed down and those undigested proteins and fats are too big to get in your blood and they end up in your lymphatic system. So we need some lymphatic support and exercise and hydration. They're all really good lymphatic cleanses support. The, doing a cleanse, like a four-day short home cleanse or a bigger Colorado Ayurvedic cleanse, the 14-day cleanse, those are all great ways to reset you for sure. But simply put, uh, you're asking what herbs to take. I would take an herb, if you don't have any heartburn or indigestion, I would take an herb called warm digest, one of those before each meal. I would take another herb called beet cleanse, which has beets and fenugreek and cinnamon and shilajit. Those are all what we call cologogs. They rotor rooter your bile ducts and make sure you make really good bile, more bile, more buffering of your stomach acid, which means more bile, better digestive strength, 
more bile, better emulsifying of the bad fats and getting in the good fats, and more bile, better and more efficient elimination. The kingpin of your digestion hubs around your liver and your production of bile in your gallbladder. That's where it all hubs. So there's an article in there about gallbladder sludge. You can read about that as well. But those are the four, the two herbs that I would take is warm digest, one before the meal, feed cleanse, one before the meal, maybe two if you need, if you're having a really big meal of each of those. And then an herb called mangista. Mangista is an Ayurvedic herb for your lymphatic system. And that lymph, the lion's share of which is around your belly. And that's why we store extra weight around our hips and our belly, uh, really important. Um, okay, um, is it, uh, I'm absolutely addicted to raisins and munch on them throughout the day. Should I be needing iron? Should I be, could I be needing the iron or am I just craving the sweetness? You know, it could be that you're needing the iron and you should probably get your iron and always get your ferritin levels checked when you get your iron done because ferritin is the storage form of iron so many times the iron in your blood looks good, but the storage form of iron, the ferritin is the sneaky one that can actually cause all the same symptoms of iron deficiency anemia, but is many times not detected. Um, so that's really important thing to test. You should also know that when you dry fruit, the sugar content just skyrockets. So I'm not a huge fan of dried fruit. You take a dried fruit like a mango, I think a regular mango has something like, I don't remember the exact numbers, um, but I can tell you roughly that a dried mango, a regular mango might have like, you know, 60, 70 grams of sugar in it or something like that, a whole mango. You dry it and it has three, 400 grams of sugar. It just explodes. So when you're eating a lot of dried fruit, you're getting concentrated sugar. And that means what goes up must come crashing down. Then you need another raisin and you crash down, you know, the raisin. So it could be either. You also could be craving the iron too. So that's something you have to get checked out and look at. Um, how do I get rid of sugar cravings? That was Don. Um, great question. I think I've answered that. Um, you know, you, you, you know, when you're, but here, I'll give you an example. The body's designed to have a breakfast and then nothing till lunch and then nothing till supper. In Ayurveda, the middle of the day is the digestive time when you can digest your food really, really well. In the afternoon, we call the vata time of day between two and six in the afternoon. That's when the nervous system, the brain kicks in and goes, I want 80% of my blood sugar and I want it right now. And you had a salad in front of your computer because you don't want to gain any weight and you're, you, you don't want to, you're just having a little nibble as you're working, right? And then the brain comes in and goes, okay, now where's all the fuel? Wouldn't, where did the, everybody on the planet for thousands of years had their biggest meal in the middle of the day, except for us Americans. Even in America, the, you know, the farming communities started out always having big meals. When the school started having lunches, they demanded the farming community that we make warm lunches for our kids, right? Right, America, no kids have warm lunch. They have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? But the, but the farming agriculture community demanded that kids have a warm lunch. Where did that come from? Our culture, we changed it. In Europe, it's still in place. So, so when you have a nice big meal and then the brain comes in and goes, where's my fuel? You're like, yeah, we had set a nice big meal, it's there for you. But if you have nothing for lunch and then the brain kicks in, the brain's gonna pull down the menu and go, okay, I need fuel. So the brain's going to pull down the meds. It's going to go, there could be coffee, there's dark chocolate, there's M&Ms, there's raisins, there's all these things that I can eat. And then you're going to, and then are you going to have the willpower to not eat those at that point? There's no such thing as willpower at that time, right? If I don't have a nice big lunch and it's three o'clock in the afternoon and someone walks by with a Snickers bar, you know, I start salivating, you know, it's not, I have no willpower at that time. So to get rid of your cravings, you have to give the body what it needs so it doesn't crave what it didn't get. Does that make sense? Now, when you fast and do intermittent fasting, things like that, your body gets into a fasting state so you are more likely to not have that craving and not have that. So when you're, let's say you're doing a one day or a two day fast on water or something, the first day is a little rough, but the second day you're just, you, you stop thinking about food because you're in a fasted state you're burning fat, you flip the switch into fasting, into fat burning. And that's what the Ayurvedic cleanses are really all about when you use ghee or clarified butter, 
is they're really designed to reset your ability to burn fat as a natural source of fuel. If you take a bunch of ghee in the morning and you have no fat during the day, that's the rule, that's the game. And when you have a bunch of ghee in the morning, that forces you into fat burning. If you had fat in your diet during the day, you would burn the dietary fat. You wouldn't burn your fat. We're after you burning your fat. So if you have a bunch of ghee in the morning, two, three, four, six, eight, ten 10 teaspoons, it kind of ramps up depending on what cleanse you're doing. You're going to flip into fat burning because you got to burn that ghee. And then you're going to burn fat all day long, as long as you didn't eat any dietary fat. And the studies show that when you do that, it flips you into a, something that Western science calls lipophilic mediated detox, where the lipophilic means that the good fats attach to the bad fats, and they actually chelate or pull the impurities out of your deep tissues. And one study showed that it actually pulled, compared to the placebo group that didn't do this cleanse, 48% more of the uh, PCBs out of the deep tissues and 58% of the pesticides out of the deep tissues, because those are fat soluble and they're storing in your deep tissues, if that makes any sense. So, um, so that's what's so neat about um, the, the cleanses that they're not only resetting fat burning, but they're also pulling toxins well studied out of your deep tissues and getting you to reset that fat, that fat metabolism. Um, so how could cravings help, uh, how could Ayurveda help with cravings and binge eating? I think I answered that. How to curb late night snacking. That's a really good one. Um, go to bed early. That's really a good one to do. I mean, you know, my guy uh, who lost 68 pounds in, in three months, you know, one of the rules was go to bed. Don't stay up till 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock because at 10 o'clock at night, starting around 9.30, there's these natural circadian cycles where biological clocks turn off and turn on. Well, the biological clocks for digestion turn off in the middle of the day, 10 o'clock to two in the middle of the day. 10 o'clock to two o'clock at night, the liver detox activates and turns on to detoxify you. It's like the janitor comes in and does the floors and the windows. But if you're up at that time of night, that extra detoxifying metabolic, metabolic activity can definitely trigger hunger. So you need to get into bed before the pit of time of night that kicks in around 10 o'clock at night and make you stay up and get on the computer and change the world and all that. But also you're going to be thinking about food at that time as well. So your liver doesn't really need, your the janitor doesn't want you clean and making cooking and you're trying to clean the kitchen and they're cooking in there. It's a mess. So you want to just give the body the ability to do the biological clock activity it's designed to do at the right time. And that means you know, have your meals in the middle of the day, an early supper if you need it, and then give the janitors a chance to do their job at night. Um, how do you sustain good intentions and not be drawn to the dark side, Mr. Sugar Craving? Um, yeah, I think that's what we just talked about, right? Is to do exactly what I just said by, by having um, a meal and don't get yourself caught, you know, in the afternoon when you didn't have a good enough lunch, you're gonna crave sugar, right? Right. So if you if you find yourself craving something, okay, ask yourself, you know, what did I have for breakfast? Was it satisfying? What did I have for lunch? Was it satisfying? And I teach, I've been, I've taught at two Ayurveda colleges for over 20 years each. And, you know, I always tell my students, I say, you know, one of the first things you need to ask your patients, your your, your clients, is how do you feel between two, three, four, five, and six o'clock at night? If you're feeling tired, you need to nap, you're craving at that time of night, then your blood sugar is unstable. You may, you need to ask, am I having a breakfast that's appropriate? Am I having a lunch that's appropriate? Am I actually crashing because I didn't eat anything and now my brain's pulling down that menu and saying, I need to get my, my blood sugar back up there, right? And I should, I should say also that there's a lot of intermittent fasting that's been done by telling people to have a, skip their breakfast, have a lunch and a supper. And that is culturally way easier, no doubt. You can easily skip breakfast and then have a lunch at noon and a supper at five and be done. And you'll still lose weight. 
And I do still encourage that if skipping supper is just culturally impossible, there's family issues going on and you just can't do it. I totally get that. But don't forget though, that at some point we wanna ultimately align ourselves with nature's circadian rhythms because your biological clocks and the nature's rhythms, they need to be in sync. So I totally get that's cultural and it will work for you. You will lose some weight, but ideally in a perfect world, you wanna, you wanna front load your meals versus have that meal for at, you know same calories uh, at lunch and for supper. Okay, I need to say that because it is a thing and it can work and I'm okay with it. Um, is it possible to get rid of spongy, bubbly, 60 year old fat that is just a coating on my body, not really overweight? Um, these are great questions and thanks so much for these guys putting these in there. And, and I know you got some stuff in the chat and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to those too, the best I can. Um, um, so that bubbly, uh, spongy <laughs> uh, fat layer that you talked about um, is lymph. That's what lymph is, that's lymph congestion. Now we have a whole <clears throat> entire lymph kit which includes Mangista, an herb called lymph cleanse, which has red root in it, an herb called lymph vein, which has got shot, uh, ground up uh, concentrated orange peel, the white pith of the oranges, <clears throat> studied to be a phenomenal lymphatic cellulite remover. It increases microcirculation, it's called lymph vein HP. I used to grind white pith of oranges and pomegranates and mangoes when I was training in India and make medicines for the heart, which increases, which is all about microcirculation and lymph drainage. And uh, <clears throat> so that's a great way to do it as well. So, but the thing is, cleaning the lymph out is, you know, you don't wanna shovel snow in a snowstorm. You wanna make sure that you've troubleshot your upper digestive system and found out what part of my digestion isn't working. If I eat a bunch of fatty food and I feel bad, that's your liver gallbladder. We gotta clean that out. Things like we have a herb called liver repair. I have articles about foods to detoxify your liver, all the greens, all the cologogs, you know, ginger, artichokes, fenugreek, um, dandelions, apple beet celery is my favorite juice. We call it ABC juice, apple beet celery. Those are all things you can do to really flush your liver out. If you have trouble with wheat and you eat wheat and get bloated, that's protein. You didn't break down your protein the way you should, which means you have stomach acid issues, right? So we got to fix that. And you can boost that with uh, things like uh, warm digest, which is going to give you the boost the stomach acid production. If you're a little bit sensitive to acid, take something called gentle digest, which is a combination of ginger, cumin, coriander, fennel, and cardamom, five very simple spices. But if you take them before the meal, they'll reboot your digestive strength and give you better overall digestion. And the better you break the food down in your stomach, the better it's gonna be delivered as energy and create satiety. But the more commonly that you don't break those foods down in your stomach, they're gonna go undigested, incompletely digested, they'll irritate the lining, end up in your lymph around your belly. And if they don't go to your lymph around the belly, I hate to say it, but they're gonna get reabsorbed back to your liver and create bile sludge. And all the lymph at the end of the day ends up in the liver anyway. So it all ends up as bile sludge, which is why number one abdominal surgery in America today is get your gallbladder removed. That's not, you know, a mystery it's because of the things I mentioned earlier, all the processed foods and things like that. So doing a lymph cleanse, doing our Colorado Ayurvedic cleanse, which is a 14 day cleanse, probably which has got the lymph cleanse in it, the liver detoxifying, a reset of your microbiome in your gut. It's 14 days, it's a bit of a chunk, but um, boy, this is a great time of year to do it now, you know, between now and the equinox. Really anytime you could do that, by the way, but you get a lot of extra benefit when you do it um, during the spring months, for sure. It's a little bit deeper of a detox. We'd love some tips for slow but steady weight loss for perimenopause. I have successfully lost eight pounds. Good for you during the 14 day Ayurvedic cleanse. That's our Colorado cleanse. But now worried I'll gain it all back. Okay, how do you, this is not springtime. You did the Colorado Ayurveda cleanse 14 days, you lost eight pounds, which is great. Now we wanna maintain it. We wanna, you have the Colorado cleanse herb, you wanna finish up those herbs because they're gonna to continue to reboot your digestive strength. And you wanna think, man, we're still in the coffee season. It's a star, low starch time of the year. So you wanna 
you know, the, you know, the, you can have the breads come fall, but right now they're a bit out of season. So start thinking about foods that are what I call recognizable, which means you recognize when you're eating something, you know, it's a tomato or it's an apple or it's wheat or barley or, or quinoa or some type of grain, or, you know, it's something that you cooked, but you can recognize what's there. And if you eat something and you don't recognize it, look at the ingredients and see if you recognize the ingredients and make sure you're eating recognizable food off the spring grocery list, which is this time of the year going to be a little bit more austere. And think about maintaining some type of calorie restriction or intermittent fasting where you maybe, you know, either skip breakfast, not my favorite thing to do, but or skip dinner. Uh, but definitely try to make two really good meals count or, you know, two meals and something really light, you know, very starch free in the evening or something like that. Um, but you do need to, you do need to keep the calorie levels down in the springtime. I remember I had a patient of mine, she came to me and she said, you know, I, I lost a bunch of weight. I'm feeling so much better. She had some anxiety and depression issues and she's, I'm feeling much better there too. And I just feel great. I just have one concern. I go, what's that? She goes, I have no appetite. I said, wow, that's not good. And she goes, yeah, but everything else is better. I just don't want to eat. And I said, she said, and I said, well, she goes, well, the only thing that I really want to eat is salad. When I asked her a bunch of questions, I said, I said, you know, everything's better. You're craving salad. It was like April, March, April. And I go, you're craving what's in season. You're craving a calorie restricted diet is a calorie restricted time of the year. It's a great thing for you to just continue to do that. Trust me, as the summer warms up, you'll get your appetite back and it did. So just, you know, if you can get to that place, it's really magical, but we got to give the body a constant nudge in this season because there's sort of good food all around us. And we have to be careful to have some willpower. And the way to do that is to have a breakfast big enough to get you to lunch and a lunch big enough to get you to supper. And then supper, either skip it or have something small that's non-starchy. Because if it's starchy, it's gonna inject you and then crash you, then you're gonna want more, right? So have like some, you know, a, you know a, like some almonds or some pistachios or an avocado and a tomato salad with some olive oil. That'll stick to your ribs and you'll feel like, that was good, I don't need that supper. And you won't gain weight on that. You'll actually sleep better and deeper with that sort of no starch meal in the evening. This is another really important point. Okay. Um, I had an ACL surgery in March with limited exercise. I have, I have gained uh, 12 pounds. I'm still struggling with movement. It's a nine month process. I know ACLs. Is it possible to lose weight during this time um, or to have to do it until I work out? You know, working out is not going to help you lose the weight. I mean, being sedentary is not good anyway. <laughs> Excuse me, but. Um, but working out is an inefficient way to lose pounds. Clearly important for many other reasons, but it isn't like the weight loss strategy unless you're really working out hard and you know all of that. Um, I would suggest doing you know either doing a cleanse. It's a great time to do that this time of the you know with now that you're laid up, you sort of kind of can't do a lot. So do either the short home cleanse or the longer cleanse. And also what I would suggest to do is do from my study, the, 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 the three meals a day, no snacks, and then the you know, smaller supper, earlier supper, no supper protocol. Do that whole protocol, which is great. Um, this is from D. I'm a 63-year-old female, healthy eater, love fitness, but stuck with excess weight and joint pain. Where to start first? Whenever you have joint pain, it makes me think that the impurities, the undigested proteins and fats are found their way into your joints. And now they're creating lymph congestion. Your lymph is taking the impurities out of your joints back into circulation to be detoxified. But if that road is clogged and there's traffic, lymphatic congestion, then those impurities are going to build up in your joints more than they should. So this is a liver lymph issue. So you want to be doing things to support liver function, liver health, and lymphatic flow. The herbs I mentioned, the lymph kit, those are really good. Uh, the herbs we mentioned, the cologogs, the apple beet and celery and fenugreek and the beets and all those things are so good to help decongest your liver and get that liver kicked in, plus all the lifestyle things that I talked about. And then you can do that. Um, um, what is MST? Hmm. I think it's Mountain Standard Time. Um, I think. I'm not sure. Uh, what time would that be in the UK, please? Uh, this was... These questions were done before, so I hope she got in the right place. Sorry. Um, 
I've been eating mostly, I think my staff might have helped you in that, hopefully. Uh, I've been eating mostly, um, according to my Ayurvedic practitioner, eating rice and porridge, maple syrup first thing in the morning, which has been bizarre for me uh, after doing mostly Whole30 intermittent fasting for like 10 years and kitchery with vegetables for lunch and dinner about seven months now. I've been slowly losing weight. However, I'm concerned about candida, even though my practitioner waves off my concerns. Any suggestions? Um, um, to accelerate the weight loss, you want to think about making sure that you're having just enough at breakfast to get you to lunch and just enough at lunch to get you to supper. And it's springtime now. So you could cut back on all those carbohydrates that you're eating because you're not really, you're eating a lot of, you know, rice porridge is fall harvested. You know, the kitchery is fall, everything's sort of fall harvested. So what I would switch your diet to things that are really low starch right now, and then give your body a break and reset fat burning and change the bugs in your gut from being really good at doing starch. Now, if you eat starchy foods all year long, guess what you're gonna have in your gut? A bunch of bugs that are super good at digesting starch, right? That's what's gonna happen. And that's what we know happens. But if you, nature said, was, said that was never the plan. You know, the plan was eat what's coming out of the ground. And in the springtime, there's no starch coming out of the ground. So you're gonna to have to have different bugs to digest the fat and the fiber you would eat from you know, leafy greens and root vegetables. That's what's supposed to be happening right now. And then, so that means you get a whole season or so of fat burning bugs. And then come fall, you have all these starches and sugars coming, and then you get a stable of bugs for burning sugar. But we never overwhelm the body year after year after year after year burning the same fuel, getting so many really good bugs who are really great at delivering fat, and that's what ends up happening. Does that make sense? So that's what's so cool about this is you wanna make sure that you change your microbiome from season to season, because that's been studied. The hunter-gatherers were studied. They all had different bugs in different seasons based on what was harvested. It makes sense, and that's how pretty much every living creature on the planet, except for us, do, because we have grocery stores and refrigerated trucks and things like that, right? Can Ayurveda help you lose weight and put your body back in a healthy rhythm like a younger, you know, even in your 60s? Oh, for sure. I mean, I'm going to be 67 this year and I feel like, you know, really good. You know, my digestion is good. I have to do these things. You know, I have to eat seasonally. I have to keep an eye on my diet. Um, my metabolism is slowing down a little bit because I'm older, but for sure, not to the extent that and I think this is the key is the stuff we talked about, the processed food, the pesticides on your food, the stress levels in your life. You know, you have to have some, some way to mitigate all those things. Otherwise, you will be chronically breaking down your digestive system and that causes problems. I uh, have reduced sugar. I don't drink alcohol. Uh, minimum takeaways uh, from doing those good things, I guess. Upper, up to physical activity such as walks, but still belly fat remains. I've been on uh, HRT, hormone replacement therapy, for the last four or five months. How do I lose stubborn midsection weight? I've never had this problem when I was younger. Started late in my 40s, um, and I've never been able to remove them even with exercise. It's hard to lose that weight with exercise. You need to give the body a reason to burn that fat. And exercise, you're going to burn sugar for an hour plus before you get anywhere near your fat, and by that time you're on your way home. So probably not going to get to that fat by by exercising, although it is still a good thing to do for so many other reasons. The way to burn that fat around your belly is to force the body into fat metabolism. And that can come from doing um, fasting is a really good way to do it. Start with intermittent fasting and build up from there. Usually a two or three day fast. You know, the first day of fasting, you get rid of um, a good chunk of the fat stored in your liver, which is reserve fuel. And now that's gone. The second day of fasting, you're gonna burn your fat and you got a big storage around your belly that is there for reserve fuel. That's why it's there. It's there for no other reason. It's your reserve fuel because the fuel that you ate wasn't needed, so you stored it. So now, if you don't eat, you're going to start to burn that. And then, of course, you know. So that's how it works. Is you that you have to get to that place. Um, you know, pretty much the only way to do it that I know of. 
the cleanses also do that as well. People do lose significant amount of weight. Um, and that's with the short home cleanse and the, uh, the Colorado Ayurvedic cleanse. So those are real important. Are there specific rules of thumb for specific body types and specific seasons? Yeah, I've written a lot of articles about that. Um, and that would be like, you know, if you're a kapha body type, which is a, think about kapha as earth and water, which is predominant in the spring. So kapha body types, I call them spring body types. Bigger, heavier set, hold on to more water. What do they need to do? Move. They're hypometabolic. They need to move, move, move. But they don't like to move so much, but they do need to move. They need to keep that body moving. Um, second thing is they need to eat um, in the springtime, you know, religiously off the, you know, the pungent and bitter and astringent foods and get off the heavy foods, the congestive foods, the wheat, the dairy, the grains in the springtime are only going to be, so because they're so against the grain of what's being harvested and they're against the grain of your particular body type. If you're a pitta body type and you're a fiery, competitive, driven body type, a lot of heat in your body type, you've got more summer heat qualities in your type, you have the tendency to be more inflamed. So you have the risk inflammation. So things to help get rid of inflammation are herbs like neem, which de-inflame your intestinal tract, mangista to de-inflame your lymphatic system. For those kapha body types, herbs like turmeric to, to decongest you are really important. And then of course, in the, if the vata body types, um, they are um, governed by air, cold and dry like winter, and they need, they need warm, sweet, heavy foods to help keep their vata and their nervous system balanced. And herbs like ashwagandha are really great for the vata body types to calm their nervous system and calm their vata down. Uh, herbs like um, bacopa is a great herb for, for that as well, for mood stability and mood support, things like that. Um, vata body types who are tendency to tend to gain extra weight come from stress, vulnerability, sensitivity, a lot of sensory radar. They feel everything and they need to support their, and that direct, that's all that stress has a compromises their digestive strength. So they start losing, losing their ability to break foods down very well. Their stomach acid becomes weaker and they start letting undigested proteins and fats get into their intestinal tract. And then they have um, problems breaking down the intestinal barrier and causing extra weight around their belly and their hips. That's usually where it comes from. Pitta body types, they have really good, strong digestion, but they have, because of all the stress and the go, go, go and workaholics and overindulgence of everything, they create irritation of the intestinal tract, which causes extra weight around their belly. And those are more of the big bloated bellies that you can definitely like tight as a drum type of a belly. That's pitta inflammation. So you have to do things to kind of cool that down. Look at the heartburn the relationship between stomach acid and liver flow, because bile is a buffer for that stomach acid. So they have to be working together if you're a pit to body type. So lots to talk about there. I've written a lot of articles about that, that topic as well. So, um, so let's go there. Let me go to, I've got another page of questions here. You guys have so many good questions. Um, but I'm gonna go here, uh, Monica, I seem only to get hungry at the end of the day. Um, should I force myself to eat breakfast and lunch? That really depends on how you're feeling. You know, um, generally speaking, the biological clocks are trying to turn on in the middle of the day and you need something very small. You don't need a lot of breakfast, but studies do show people who eat breakfast have better metabolic health. They have less blood sugar, less diabetes when they get older. This, the science is there is in. Very controversial. I've written articles about it. And I get clobbered on social media when I say that because everybody's like, skip breakfast, have lunch and dinner and intermittent fast. That's like the new way of doing it. But people don't necessarily read the science and read the studies. They don't understand the ancient wisdom that goes along with that. And what I try to talk about is take the ancient principles and then see if there's science to back them up. If someone is doing this stuff for two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 years, and now we have science to prove it, I kind of hang my hat there. You know, that's where I kind of want to live. Not because the newest, latest fads that I should skip my breakfast and have a lunch and dinner. It has no basis in history and really, you know, very little basis in science. You'll lose weight, but in terms of your biological clocks, your body's going like, why didn't I get breakfast? Because you just fasted all night long and the body now wants to break that fast and start the metabolism for the day. 
And that's hard science. I did a podcast with uh, uh, Pachin, Sachin Panda, who wrote the book called The Circadian Code, one of the top circadian researchers on the planet. And he says, you need to, you need to start your day with a little bit of something. Get up, exercise, move around for a couple of hours, but then you got to break the fast with something. It doesn't need to be a lot, but you need to put something in your mouth. Um, that's reasonable to help get the body to say, oh, it's time to start my day metabolically, and here I go. So I would play with that and see how you feel. But I don't want to disrupt if you're feeling really good, you know what I mean? Because it's because it's because you're feeling really good. And uh, you know, so there's so something to think about. Uh, how do I get access to the list of resources I did not receive an email when I signed up? The list of resources, I will post it again right here. I don't know if it's in the chat, but here it is again. Um, so that is a link to all the articles right there. I just posted it for you. So you can look at that and get that. Uh, that was a question. Um, so, okay, good. Um, your thoughts on those of us who are no longer have our gallbladder? Really great question. I wrote an article about that. <clears throat> I'm not a fan of getting parts taken out if they don't need to be taken out. But you got to know also that the gallbladder is a sack of bile that's 25 times concentrated. It's designed for eating enough bile to you know, digest the brains and intestines of a woolly mammoth in one sitting, which I know is gross, but that's our history ancestrally. Um, so, so we don't eat that kind of fat anymore, ever. So as a result of being told we should eat low fat for many, many years, we end up having a gallbladder that's become very sluggish as well as atrophied, as well as congested, as well as sludgy, not to mention all the processed foods doesn't help. So um, not having a gallbladder and getting it taken out isn't really that big of a deal as it was, you know, a long, long time ago. If you're a hunter-gatherer and they took out your gallbladder, you're in trouble probably because um, that was feast or famine around the fat when it was animals were first harvested like that. Um, so um, the only thing when you get your gallbladder taken out is that a lot of times the underlying digestive problem has never been addressed. All you did was take the gallbladder out. If you have an issue with bile flow or congested bile ducts or congested biliary tubes in your liver or poor or stomach acid, then that problem is probably still going to be there. So um, there are a lot of things you want to do to help support your liver function, production of bile, heal your intestinal skin, change your microbiome, reboot stomach acid, um, give yourself a visceral massage. My favorite way to do that is I we have these vibrating rollers. They're called vipers. They're these crazy strong rollers that vibrate. And I put it on the ground and then I, and this would be great without a gallbladder. And then you just kind of put my, put my hands on the floor and I just put all my weight on that vibrating roller. And I just roll my abdomen from under my rib cage all the way down to my pubic bones. And I just give my body an incredible visceral massage. <clears throat> my goodness. My stomach is like red and itchy and it's just completely massaged. It's amazing. And there's three settings on that thing. You put on the high setting and um, boy, boy, it's really a, an incredible massage. And I love that because I can do it every other day and, you know, just get that benefit without having to go pay for someone to massage my belly. Um, it's amazing. They're called the Viper on my website. You can check them out. They're, they're really cool. And that's one way to help get that, get that gallbladder, get those bile ducts, which are like thin, like this pen, you know, they're thin. So easily they can get so congested and the bile ducts connect before they go into your intestinal tract, they connect with your pancreatic duct. So if your bile ducts are sludgy, in 91% of the cases, the pancreatic duct joins the bile duct before it goes into your intestinal tract, which means that if you have blocked your bile sludge because of bad fats, you're also going to not have your digestive enzymes flowing into your intestinal tract, which means you're going to need digestive enzymes, which you don't really need if your tubes were open, right? So these are a lot of things to think about, of course. Um, and that's why I keep writing so many articles about this to help you guys do it on your own. And that's why I gave you the eBooks where you can go, okay, here's my digestive troubleshoot guys, step by step by step by step. You know, here's a, uh, I have a lymphatic articles, lymphatic eBook. We've got the blood sugar eBook to give you step by step ways to make all that, you know, better for yourselves. Um, I seem to only, oh, okay, that was that other question. Um, great question. Does a good lunch 
what does a good lunch look like? A good lunch looks like whatever you need to get to supper without having hunger. It should be a quarter of your plate protein, a quarter of your plate starch, depending on the season, and the rest of it, green vegetables, you know, fibrous vegetables, right? In the springtime, those starches might be dialed down a little bit and the fibrous foods might be, but you could also take foods like carrots and beets, which are also, um, you know, they're, they're a little bit starchy, but not really that starchy, right? Uh, you can do a sweet potato instead of, you know, pizza or something, or, you know, bread or a white potato or something like that. So you can do things to, mi to minimize the starch this time of the year. But I don't mean to say that you should not have it because you're going to want to walk away from the table satisfied too. But you want to you want to find that sweet spot in the springtime where you don't need as much starch. But um, so it's a balance of starch, greens, and your protein. Okay, and that protein can be, you know, it could be uh, nuts and seeds. It can be fish. It can be, you know, other types of meat uh, if that's you know what you prefer. Um, in terms of meat, I'm a, generally speaking, I like people to, to move in the direction of a 10% animal protein diet and a 90% plant-based diet. That's what I, there's so many, so much science behind that. The hunter, the, the centenarians eat like that. All the research points to that being the healthiest diet. Uh, and all the research shows that that's the best way for us to feed the planet as we become uh, uh, more populated. Um, can you talk about a fatty liver? Yeah, great question, uh, Sharon. Thanks for that. The, what men I just mentioned that your bile duct goes into your small intestine, but at 91% of the people, the pancreatic duct joins that duct first. So when the bile is trying to move and the bile duct is congested, the bile will backflow into the liver, creating a fatty liver, and the digestive enzymes will backflow into the pancreas, sometimes even causing pancreatitis. So that's why those, that bile sludge is so critically important. And that's why I'm such a big fan of visceral massage, to get in there and really massage that whole area and keep that supple. I have an article um, called Stomach Pulling. I didn't put that on our, our list, but you can just type it on my website. <clears throat> And read the article on stomach pulling, and you should be able to. Um, you should be able to when you do this. Is go is take your fingers and poke underneath here. And as you poke underneath here, your rib cage. If you feel oh like a little soreness when I poke right there, then I want to pull down on that and then breathe in as I arch my back, and then relax, breathe out, find that soreness again, pull in and pull down on it, and breathe in and arch my back. And you want to get in there and break up that scar tissue. So underneath your rib cage on both sides, it's, it's like a baby's belly, nice and soft and spongy. That's what you're looking for, right? And that's what the stomach pulling and the visceral massage techniques are really all about to get that to be nice and soft and spongy, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's a great question, but you got to get that. And then think about doing, you know, I also have a, an ebook called the Safe Liver Cleansing Ebook, which is a one month preparation. And I didn't put that on the list here because it's a little bit more of an advanced cleanse. But the one month preparation is to prepare your liver for a liver flush and a bile flush. If you have a fatty liver and you seem to be digesting okay and you're fairly healthy, take a look at that ebook. It's in my ebook library right on my website, lifespy.com. And just type in and, and search the, the, the library for the safe liver cleansing ebook. There's a one month preparation for a two day gallbladder liver flush, which is amazing. I, I love that flush. Um, and a lot of paid people have done that flush um, over the years. Uh, in a, and I learned that back in 1984 when I was in chiropractic college, been doing it with my patients forever. But I never felt like the cleanse was something that anybody could do anytime. It was too aggressive. And there was a book written about it that got everybody doing it whenever they want multiple times. And there were a lot of casualties, people who didn't do well with it. A lot of miracles too, no doubt about that. So I decided to put that 
liver flush on my website, but with a one month preparation to prepare you for, your, for this flush so you didn't crash and burn. Because I ended up getting a lot of patients who were really having chronic fatigue issues after this cleanse and so on things, because you can push them too much bile and become kind of exhausted. And your bile is like a Pac-Man gobbling up toxins, right? Cleaning your intestinal tract, cleaning your liver, taking the fiber all the way and the toxins all the way to the toilet. And if you deplete yourself of bile too aggressively, you can be, you, you cannot have the bile to deliver the fat as energy. So you're exhausted. You cannot have the bile to take the toxins to the toilet and you can become toxic. So there are a lot of casualties by people doing that cleanse too aggressively, too frequently, things like that. So that's why I wrote the ebook called the Safe Liver Cleansing ebook, because it has a one month prep for everybody to do before they are allowed to do the actual flush. But it's an amazing resource and it's completely free on my website. Um, but you know, it's great cleanse to know about. And another cleanse in addition to our Colorado cleanse and other and short home cleanses, another thing to do, particularly when you're looking down the road of fatty liver and you know, those kind of issues, okay? Um, yeah, great question. Do you offer remote teleconferences one-on-one? -on -one? I do offer consultations. I, I hate to say that I have a, a bit of a wait list. I, I, it's a couple of months, I think now, or something like that. Um, but I also, uh, we do have cancellations and people get in all the time. I had a guy today who's going for gallbladder surgery tomorrow and he got in a cancellation and we were able to help him out um, today. So that was kind of cool. So uh, yeah, if you need that for sure. Um, Warm, raw dairy, paneer, okay, in the spring. Um, sort of, but not really. Um, in the springtime, the cows are giving, their, giving birth to their babies. And during the spring and the summer, those babies need all the milk they can get. And at the end of the summer, when the cows are pretty big and ready to really feed and get on the, and be on their own, and that happens very quickly, then there's a lot of extra milk. And that extra milk was then made into cheese or paneer or into ghee or things like that. And those foods would be able to store and last through the winter. And that's how people originally, like in the Alps and so on, they were able to manage and navigate the cold winter months because they had the cow's milk that they would store for themselves all winter. But the springtime is a wet, rainy, muddy, congested time of the year. And dairy is a very wet, rainy, muddy, congested food, right? So for adults, it's a, it can be a little bit challenging in the springtime. So if you're gonna do it, you can do a low fat version of that as long as it's not. And I'm also a big fan of uh, non-homogenized non-pasteurized or vat pasteurized milk is what you can get. And that's legal in every state called vat pasteurized. It's slow boiled as opposed to ultra high heat boiled flash pasteurized. So those are things you can do as well. Um, okay. Uh, all right, guys, I have more questions and, I, and we still have time, a um, little bit of time. Let me go through some of these other, um, these other questions here. Um, aside from intermittent fasting and staying attentive to my, my, my body, mind, and spirit, I find treating the whole being is important, is key. Focusing on weight loss is only optimal unless you are setting intentions to embrace not only the loss of pounds, but also to manage a new lifestyle that supports keeping balance. Uh, Tridoshic, sattvic qualities. Looking forward to it, doctor. Well, that is absolutely, thank you, Rhonda, for that. It's absolutely what we talk about on my website. Uh, I was reluctant to put out a podcast saying weight loss. Um, because that's not, you have a hard, find, hard time finding that word on my website. Um, because not really about weight loss. It's really about weight balancing. It's really about supporting function and recognizing that at the end of the day, and I've written so many articles on the science of sattva, science of giving, loving, and being kind, how important the stress and the emotions are for weight loss. A lot of times it's the underlying mental, emotional patterns of behavior that we created as young children, that we still project on the screen today as adults that are driving the same repetitive behaviors, including eating habits that make us eat and crave the same things. The cool thing is when you do an Ayurvedic cleanse, you're forced to burn fat. In an Ayurveda, molecules of emotion, which were coined by the NIH researcher Candace Pert, also known as mental ama in Ayurveda, are stored in the fat cells. So when you do an Ayurvedic cleanse and you reset fat burning, as we talked about this whole time today, 
you're going to force the body to burn fat and release all the toxins and detoxify and get stable fuel and sleep through the night and feel better and burn all the fat, lose the weight, all that. But more importantly, maybe most importantly, you're going to release the molecules of emotion, mental ama from the deep stores of your fat. And they're going to become more available on your radar screen. So you have the ability to, to see more clearly why you're doing the same dumb thing again and again and again. And we move into the whole field of Ayurvedic psychology, which I've written a ton about. Matter of fact, I'm doing a whole course on Ayurvedic psychology with uh, online course with Kupala this fall, uh, the yoga center in the, on the East Coast, Kupala. Um, and in our Colorado Ayurveda cleanse, we have a self-inquiry guide. So while you're burning the fat for 14 days, we give you tools to become more self-aware as the patterns of behavior become more available on the screen. So you become more self-aware of why you start acting like a four-year-old when you go home for the holidays, you know, those kinds of things. And you begin to then be able to have the clarity to take action to free yourself from those patterns. I love this question, Rhonda. Thank you so much, because it's really the crux of the whole thing is Ayurveda was about not losing weight, not getting rid of your heartburn, not, you know, living forever. It was about raising our self-awareness, becoming more self-aware of the most subtle things in life. The human body has the ability to perceive subtle energy like no other instrument. And we also hold on to a lot of old emotion that holds us back and keeps us locked into repetitive patterns of behavior that disallow us from having higher states of consciousness, raising our awareness above the fray, as opposed to being, you know, rocking and rolling with every emotional rock in the riverbed. And that's what Ayurveda is really about, is to, to detoxify us, burn the fat, free us from old emotions, and then have the clarity to see the problems as problems and take action to free ourselves from those patterns of behavior. And then you find yourself accessing the sattva, the kindness, the joy, and the giving, because it's your nature to be that way, not because you were told to be kind. Nice to be kind, even if you're told to be kind. But the, but the reality is it's our nature to be that way. And that's what Ayurveda was trying to do, is raise our vibration. I don't necessarily like that because you're not really raising a vibration, but you're raising your perception of the most subtle things in your body. And that's your consciousness, the love and the, and the, the giving and the kindness, which is armored up because of this crazy world we live in. And we feel uh, oftentimes unable to or unwilling to be kind. Um, uh, Henry James wrote a book years and years ago. And he said that, he uh, was a famous author from the early 1900s. And he said that the most important, three most important things a human can do in their life is number one, be kind. Second most important thing that a human can do in their life is number two, be kind. And the third most important thing that a human can do with it in their life, number three, is to be kind. And of course, Mr. Rogers picked up on that and he taught that to kids for generations. And it's really when you think about that, be kind, be kind, be kind, it's like, okay, whoa, I can be kind, but then I got to be kind twice. That's a lot of be kind. I mean, I can get run over. I can get taken advantage of if I'm that kind, right? But you begin to start to realize that when you are letting who you truly are out, you can never lose anything. You know, the sun never stops shining, never stops giving. Our nature is to be that. And when we do give care, love others, we find amazing things happen to the body. The longevity hormone oxytocin proliferates like crazy. We get off the dopamine reward chemistry train. The good bugs proliferate, the bad bugs disappear. There's epigenetic effects on your genetic code that are dramatically beneficial for us, the giver, and even more beneficial for the receiver when you give without expectation when you give in a eudaimonic way where you don't get anything in return. You're not giving because you want them to like you or think you're the great gift giver. And when you give in a hedonistic way where you want some praise in return, it actually had a negative effect on the genetic code of the person we're giving it to. But when you give freely from your heart, it changes the game. The people we're giving it to can tell if you're full of it 
and you want that praise and you're just looking for self praise or reward, they can tell the difference. And when they feel you giving from your heart, they feel safe enough in that to open up the petals of their very delicate emotional flower and let who they are out. And I think we all long to do that, but we don't feel safe in our environment to do that anymore, particularly in the culture we live in. And that's what this is really all about. Ayurveda was all about getting our body into balance, burning the fat, so you get rid of the old emotions. There's so many other ways that I didn't talk about how to do that today, but weight loss is sort of a kind of an entree into really burning fat and then realizing what burning fat is really all about is burning stored fat soluble molecules of emotion that hold on to pre-recorded stress responses in your fat cells that make you think and do the dumb stuff again and again and again without even having any recognition and awareness that you just did that. It's automatic and unconscious. And Ayurveda was about us becoming conscious. You know, so it's really cool. That's a great, great question. I think um, a great one to end on. Um, I really hope you guys had all your questions answered. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Like I said, there's some really good links that I put in this chat here for you. And also you go to my website at lifespot.com and you know, you have any of these questions. So you can always email me too at john, J-O-H-N at lifespot.com. It's my direct email, you guys. So you can email me there and say, hey, you know what, John, I have this problem and, you know, or, or, you know, or we can try to direct you to an article that would be appropriate. And, you know, if, if need be a consult, I'm always, you know, I'm still in practice and I love that. I just, I, I apologize that I'm just not that available, but I, but I'm not going anywhere either. So, all right, you guys, thank you all so much. You guys were great. Thanks for all your wonderful questions. Thanks for spending your time with me tonight. Um, you guys are great. And like I said, I think one of our last podcasts, I hope to do more of these podcasts um, just to give you guys an opportunity to just, for us all to just dive deep together and, uh, and go and go deeper into different topics. So if you have a topic that you like, maybe you know, shoot us an email. Let us know what you want to hear me do a podcast or a not a podcast, a webinar on. Okay, you guys, have a great night. Thank you and a great week. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share. This recording is brought to you by Life Spa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at LifeSpa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.